Having considered the nature of spiritual affections is renewed by grace. In those notions of their objects under which they cleave to them, it remains only that we inquire into the way of the soul's application of itself to those objects by its affections, which belongs also to our being spiritually minded. And I shall give an account of this and some few particulars with brief observations on them. First, it is required that our adherence to all spiritual things with love and delight be firm and stable. The affections are the powers and instruments of the soul in which it makes application to anything without itself and cleaves to it. This is their nature and use with reference to things spiritual. Transient thoughts of spiritual things with vanishing desires may rise out of present convictions as they did with them who cried, to our Savior, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And then they immediately left him. Such occasional thoughts and desires are common to all sorts of men. Yea, the worst of them, let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. Fading satisfaction with joy and delight do often befall men in their attendance on the word, who yet never come to have it rooted in their hearts. There are a number of things lacking to the sincerity of these affections. 1. Those who have the counterfeit never had a clear spiritual view of the things themselves in their own nature which they pretend to be affected with. Number 2. They don't have a sincere love to them and delight in them for their own sakes, but are only affected with some outward circumstances and concerns of them. Number 3. They don't find a suitableness in them to the ruling principles of their minds. They do not practically. They cannot truly say, The yoke of Christ is easy and its burden is light. His commandments are not grievous. Or with the psalmist, Oh, how love I thy law. Number four. Their affections are transient, unstable, vanishing. As to their exercise and operations. They are on and off, now pleased and anon displeased, earnest for a little while, and then cold and indifferent. So the things which they seem to affect have no transforming efficacy upon their souls. They don't dwell on them in their power, but where our affections to spiritual things are sincere, where they are true, genuine, application of the soul and adherence to them, they are firm and stable, Love and delight are kept up to such a constant exercise as renders them immovable. This is that which we are exhorted to in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Transient affections with their occasional operations deceive multitudes. Oftentimes they are as pregnant in their actions as those that are most sincere. In many effects and joys, in mornings and complaints they will produce, especially when excited by any outward affliction, sickness, and the like. But their goodness is like the early cloud or morning dew. Let none, therefore, please themselves with the operation of transient affections with respect unto spiritual things, be they never so urgent. They're so pleasant, they're so frequent in their returns, those that are sincere at all times firm and stable. Number two, that the soul finds a spiritual relish and savor in the things which it so adheres to. The affections are the palate of the soul in which it tastes of all things which it receives or refuses, and it will not long cleave to anything which they do not find its savor and relish in. Something was spoken before of that sweetness which is in spiritual things, and the taste of them consists in a gracious sense of their suitableness to the affections, inclinations, and dispositions of the mind, so they have no relish to men of carnal minds. Whoever therefore would know whether his affections sincerely adhere to spiritual things, let him examine what relish, what sweetness, what savor he finds in them. When he is pleased with them as a palate with suitable and proper food, when he finds it receives nourishment by them in the inward man, then he adheres to them in a due manner. This spiritual taste is a ground of all experience. 
It is not what we have heard or understood only, but what we have tried and tasted of and which we have experienced. This makes us long for what we have formerly enjoyed and strengthens faith as to what we pray for and expect. In every darkness, in every damp spirit, under every apprehension of deadness or the withdrawing of the sense of divine love, the soul knows what it wants and what it desires. Oh, says such an one, it were now with me as in former days. I know he who then gave me such refreshing tastes of its own goodness, who made everything of himself sweet and pleasant to me, can renew this work of his grace towards me. He can give me a new spiritual appetite and relish. He can make all spiritual things savory to me again. Is a man under a languishing sickness or when he is chastened with strong pain? So as that his soul abhors bread and its daily meat, and remember what appetite he had, with what gust and relish he was wont to take in his food in the days of his health, what makes him to know that there is such a condition, and to desire to return to it. So is it with a sin-sick soul. It can find no relish, no gust, no sweetness in spiritual things. He finds no savor in the bread of the word, nor any refreshment in the ordinances of the gospel which yet in themselves are daily meat, a feast of fat things and of well, well refined. Yet does it remember former days when only things were sweet to him. And if he has any spark of spiritual life yet remaining, it will stir him up to seek with all diligence after a recovery. How is it with you who are now under spiritual decays, who find no taste or relish in spiritual things, to whom the word is not savory, nor other ordinances powerful. Call to mind how it has been with you in former days, and what you found in these things. If so be, saith the apostle, that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you have not, it is to be feared that you have never yet had the least sincere love to spiritual things, for where that is, it will give a spiritual relish of them. If you have, how is it that you can give yourselves rest one moment without an endeavor after the healing of your backsliding? It is required that our affections be so set on spiritual things as to be a continual spring of spiritual thoughts and meditations. No man can be so forsaken of reason as to suppose that he has any sincere affection for what he thinks little on, or not at all or that he can have a true affection for anything which will not stir up and generate in him continual thoughts about it. Let men try themselves as to their relations, or their enjoyments, or the objects of their predominant lust, and they will find how things are stated in their own minds. And therefore, whereas all men pretend to love God and Christ and the ways of God, and yet, Know in their own hearts that they little think of them or meditate upon them, both their pretense and religion is vain, for our affections are duly placed on heavenly things, so as that we are indeed spiritually minded. There will be a constant spring of spiritual thoughts and meditations, but this also has been before spoken to. When our affections are thus applied to spiritual things, they will be prevalent and victorious against solicitations to the contrary, or allurements to draw them off to any other objects. The work of all of our spiritual adversaries is to solicit and tempt our affections, to divert them from their proper object. There are some temptations of Satan that make an immediate impression on the mind and conscience, such as his injection into the mind of diabolical blasphemous thoughts concerning God, his being nature and will, and the distresses which he reduces men to in their consciences through darkness and misrepresentations of God and his goodness. But the high road and constant practice of all our spiritual adversaries is by the solicitation of our affections to objects that are in themselves, or in the degree of our affections toward them, evil and sinful, of the first or all sensual pleasures of the flesh, as drunkenness, uncleanness, gluttony, chambering, and wantonness, with all sorts of sensual pleasures, of the latter is all our inordinate love to self, 
or families in the whole world or the things of it. To this end, everything in the whole world they may make provision for the lust is made use of, and this consists in nature and efficacy of most of those temptations which we have to conflict with. Solicitations they are of our affections, to draw them off from things spiritual and heavenly, and to divert them to other things. By this our enemies endeavor to beguile us, as a serpent beguiled Eve, with fair and false representations of other beloveds, that our hearts be not preserved as a chaste virgin in all their affections for Christ. And it is almost incredible how apt we are to be beguiled by the specious pretenses in which we are solicited. Did our affections and the degree treated about suppose of love to the world and the things of it are lawful and allowable? It's one of the sophisms and artifices in which many are deluded. Hereon, provided they do not run into scandalous excesses, they approve of themselves in such a worldly frame of mind, and acting according to it as renders them fruitless, useless, senseless, and is inconsistent with that prevailing adherence of affections to spiritual things that ought to be in us. Others are deluded by a pretense that it is in one instance only they would be spared. It is but this or that object that would give out the embraces of the affections too. In all other things it will be entire for God. The vanity of which pretenses we have spoken here before. Others are ruined by giving place to their solicitations with respect to any one affection whatever. It's supposed to be that of carnal fear. In times of danger, for profession, Multitudes have lost all their affection to spiritual things through a fear of losing that which is temporal. It's their lives, their liberties, their goods, and the like. When one Satan and the world have gotten, as it were, a mastery of this affection, or a prevalent interest in it, they will not fail to draw all others into an affection from Christ and the gospel. He that loves his life shall lose it. Therefore it is no ordinary no easy thing to preserve our affections pure, entire, and steady in their vigorous adherence to spiritual things against all these solicitations, watchfulness, prayer, faith, and exercise, and a daily examination of ourselves are required to this end. For lack of a due attendance to these things, and that with respect to this end, namely the preservation of our spiritual affections and their integrity, many, even before they are aware, die away as to all power and vigor of spiritual life. Affections thus fixed upon things spiritual and heavenly will give great relief against the remainders of that vanity of mind which believers themselves are oftentimes perplexed with. Yea, I do not know anything that is a greater burden to them, nor which they more groan for deliverance from. The Instability of the Mind its readiness to receive impressions from things vain and useless, the irregularity of their thoughts are a continual burden to many. Nothing can give the soul any relief in this. Nothing can give bounds to the endless variety of foolish imaginations. Nothing can drive the springs from whence they arise, or render the soil in which they grow barren as to their production and maintenance, but only the growth of spiritual affections with their continual vigorous actings on heavenly things. For by this a heart and mind will be so united to them. That which the psalmist prays for in Psalm 86, 11, is that they will not be ready to depart from them and give entertainment to vain, empty, foolish imaginations. Thoughts of other things greater and better than what this world can contain will be continually arising in the mind not to be laid aside by any solicitations of vanity. For he that is wise cannot but know and consider that the spiritual things which it exercises its thoughts about have substance in them. They are durable, profitable, always the same. Did the advantage, peace, rest, riches, and reward of the soul lies in them? But other imaginations, which a foolish mind is apt to give entertainment to, are vain, empty, fruitless, such as end in shame and trouble. Again, the vanity of the mind in an indulgence to foolish imaginations arises from, or is animated and increased by that gust and relish which it finds in earthly things. 
in enjoyment of them, whether they are lawful or unlawful. So on all occasions, yea, in holy duties, it will be ready to turn aside and take a taste of them, and sometimes to take up with them, like a tipping traveler, who though he be engaged in a journey on the most earnest occasion, yet he cannot but be bibbin here and there as he passes by, and it may be at length before he comes to his journey's end, lodges himself in a nasty alehouse. When men are engaged in important duties, yet if they always are carrying on about them a strong gust and relish of earthly things, they will ever and anon in their thoughts divert to them, either as to such real objects as they are accustomed to, or as to what present circumstances administer to corrupt affections, or as to what they fancy and create in their own minds, and sometimes it may be after they have made them a few short visits, they take up with them, and lose wholly the work they were engaged in. Nothing, as was said, would give relief in this but the vigorous and constant exercise of our affections on heavenly things. For this will insensibly take off that gust and relish, which the mind is found in things present, earthly and sensual, and make them as a sapless thing to the whole soul. They will so place a cross of Christ in particular on the heart as that the world shall be crucified to it, losing all that brightness, beauty, and savor, which it makes use of to solicit our minds to thoughts and desires about it. Moreover, this frame of spirit alone will keep us on our watch against all those ways and means in which the vanity of the mind is excited and maintained. Such are the wandering and roving of the outward senses, the senses, especially that of the eye, are ready to become purveyors to make provision for the vanity and lust of the mind. Hence the psalmist prays, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. If the eyes rove after vain objects, the mind will ruminate upon them. And another affirms that he had made a covenant with his eyes to preserve them from fixing on such objects as might solicit lust or corrupt affections. And it would be a useful labor, would this place admit of it, to discover the ready servableness of the outward senses and members of the body to sin and folly, if they are not watched against Romans 6, verses 13 and 19. Of the same nature is the incessant work in the fancy and imagination, which if Self is evil continually and all the day long. This is a food of a vain mind, and a vehicle or means of conveyance for all temptations from Satan and the world. Besides, a number of occasions of life and conversation are usually turned or abused to the same end, exciting and exercising of the vanity of the mind. Whatever our affections are fixed on spiritual things, our mind will constantly be under a warning or charge to keep diligent watch against all those things in which that vanity which it so abhors, which it is so burdened with, is maintained and excited. Nor without this prevalency in the mind will ever a work of the mortification of sin be carried on in the soul. Colossians 3 verses 2, 4, and 5 John Owen, Chapter 20